Welcome uh, to the GitHub 101 session. Um, first of all, I will apologize for my voice. Um, I am one of those dads, and I have a 14-year-old daughter who was in a very competitive lacrosse game this weekend. <laughs> and uh, my wife informed me that I'm not supposed to be coaching from the sideline, but that's very hard to, not to do. So I am one of those dads. So. Um, <clears throat> What we're going to talk about today is uh, what is GitHub, and Git and GitHub sort of go together. And I came to GitHub after being a user um, since 2008, and there's actually a really neat little feature that if anybody here is an API developer, um, GitHub has its own APIs, and you can actually look up your GitHub username. So if you go to the APIs, users, your username, you can actually get the ID and the ID that comes out is just an increment. So when you go out there and if you look up uh, Chris Wanstrath, who is our CEO, um, his ID number is two. Um, so I'm very proud that we now have over 10 million users on github.com. And out of those 10 million users, I am actually in the first 40,000. So um, <clears throat> there's a ton of buzz about GitHub, and there's some things that I want to bring up today because I know there's a lot of organizations when we talk about Git and GitHub, about the benefits of GitHub for your organization, especially for those of you, how many people were in the keynote? Okay. So we believe very firmly in the same ideas that Jim brought up um, about the open enterprise. And so for me, where I came from is I am a solutions architect. My name's Lee Faust. I had my own business for about five years. And what I did is I did business transformation for companies. And what we did is the business transformation that we did is we were doing DevOps before it was called DevOps. We were doing a lot of automation, a lot of discovery. We were building microservices before we called them microservices. Everything was being built to live on VMs that never had more than a gig of memory available to them. Um, we then started playing around with containers, started using those when Docker was in point two. Um, so a lot of the things that we did is we did all of our coding and everything, everything through GitHub because one of the things that allowed us to be able to do is to communicate with other developers and allow people to be able to see things before they ever made it into production. So like one of the key things that with the Internet of Things, and we look at IoT devices, one of the things that we actually talk about is the cost of a bug going into production is going to escalate dramatically over the next five to 10 years. So when you think about what that device, when it's actually sitting in your wall, when that device is sitting uh, on the pavement, and if a bug actually makes it into that release, how quickly am I gonna be able to go out and re-deliver that code to that device? It may take me a month, it may take me a week, it may take me a day. It all depends on what the infrastructure actually looks like to be able to deliver those. With GitHub, we try to provide a platform that allows other developers to see what is going on before it ever even makes it into production. So I've got over 20 years of development experience. I'm actually really excited. I live in Mooresville now, but my family, we actually moved from Holly Springs. So um, I'm, I feel like I'm coming home, so this is nice to be back. Um, I actually taught at Athens Drive High School for two years, um, and then from there I was an adjunct at NC State. I taught there when I worked for a company, a startup on Centennial, actually right a, a diagonal from um, Red Hat called TogetherSoft. So um, now here I am at GitHub doing another startup and I was super excited to talk to you guys about Git and GitHub. So what is Git? How many people here use SVN? Okay, got some SVN users. How many here use ClearCase? Any ClearCase users? A few ClearCase. How about CVS? Any CVS users? Got some CVS. So a lot of the different version control systems that we see today um, we're seeing a shift, and that shift is going from a centralized distributed version control system to a distributed version control system. And that, it's a really fancy term of being able to say, I can actually work locally on my machine and make all kinds of changes without having to always commit them back up to a central repository. When I actually have a set of code that I feel like I'm ready to share, then I do what's called a push. 
and that push is when everybody else can see the changes that I'm going to make. The other thing is, is what we find is because people have their own little mini version control system on their machine, that what they en end up doing is they get to experiment a lot more. So there's really easy ways, and I'm going to show you some ways to be able to go in, create some commits, and then I can do a revert, and then I can undo a change because it's not exactly what I was looking for. Before, when I, I've used CVS, I've used ClearCase, I've used SVN, what we used to do is we, I would have development teams where the developers would wait a week before they would ever commit their code. They'd make a whole bunch of changes and just save, 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 save. And then all of a sudden, it's Friday afternoon, we're getting ready for a code review, and they would go ahead and do a commit at the end of the week. And all of a sudden, they've changed 186 files. And now you're going to do a code review, and you're kind of like, how am I supposed to review 186 files in two hours? So when people are able to be able to do these small little incremental changes locally and they feel a lot more comfortable about what they're building, then when they push it, some of the things we'll look at in GitHub is we then have a communication a sharing uh, facility inside of GitHub called a pull request that you can actually go through and actually start a conversation with other people. So the place where if you want to get started with Git, um, the best place is what I call the book. This is my Bible. Um, it is the place that I go to because it is, for me, Git from the command line is like VI and Emacs. There are some really good people that I sit down with and I pair program with and I see them using Git and I'm like, what did you just do? That was really cool. And they're like, oh, I created this macro and I saved it into my Git config and I have all these colors. I'm like, oh, wow, that is awesome. And for me, I am still a, I have to go back to a book or to a set of references to actually walk me through what do all the different commands do. Now, if you're not a command line person, the good news is, is that there's also a number of GUI tools that exist that you can use to be able to use on top of Git as well. So if you're on a Mac, uh, there's a really nice tool called Tower. Um, we also have one that we built from GitHub that we have a GitHub desktop which um, we just released a new version about um, uh, four months ago that runs on both Windows and on Mac. Um, there's a number of other GUI tools from other companies uh, so to get you comfortable. Um, so I'm going to be walking through some of the command line because I know for a lot of people that like to know what's sort of going on under the hood. And then we'll talk about what some of the UI tools will, uh, could look like as well. So installation of Git. Um, how many people here are Windows users? Okay. I'm sorry, you're going to have to install Git yourself. <laughs> okay. Um, most of the basic Linux distributions, all of the Mac machines that you get today, all have Git pre-installed. Not necessarily the latest version. Um, so sometimes you may have to patch it, you may have to upgrade it, you have to get the latest version. And if anybody here, you guys are really lucky because Git is now a first class citizen from probably about Windows 8 and beyond. If you're still on Windows XP, um, you may actually have to do some compiling. Um, so uh, as you start to go through some of the different tools, what happens is uh, there's a number of things under the hood because it's basically Git is like a little mini file system that sits on top of uh, your actual operating system. So there's some things that have to happen in the background. Um, so if you're on Windows, the easiest way to be able to do it is actually, for me, um, anytime I have to install it on a Windows machine, as I tell people, even if you don't plan to use the uh, um, Git desktop, um, the GitHub desktop for Windows, if, even if you choose not to use the GUI, it already comes with Git bash. So you can already go in, you can start using command line tools. It plugs directly into PowerShell. So you can actually start right from there and never have to pull up the GUI at all. So once you have Git installed, this is probably the most confusing part about getting Git up and running is because you're doing these things locally, if I'm in SVN or if I'm in CVS or if I'm in ClearCase, when I'm doing my commits locally, I know who I am on my machine. Well, Git doesn't know who you are. And there's actually many different ways that you can actually configure who you are. Um, how many people here contribute to an open source project? Great, awesome. Um, 
How many of you use your work um, email address to be able to collaborate on those open source projects? Okay, so that's good as well. So we have a, a large number of companies that are now evolving to the point that they're allowing employees to do CLAs, contributor license agreements, to be able to show that, hey, this particular company supports their developers spending four hours a week, whatever, being able to contribute, knowing that that code most likely will end up coming back in-house at some point in time to be able to assist. Maybe it's a fix to Tomcat. Maybe it's a fix to Apache web server. Maybe it's a fix to Twitter bootstrap. Whatever it might be, those things end up coming back into the organization as a whole. So one of the things that we end up seeing a lot for individuals is when we're doing open source projects is you have to maintain multiple identities on your machine. So the easiest way obviously to do this is some of us are fortunate enough that we have two machines. So I can have one machine that I use at work and I have one machine that I use when I'm at home. But we all know how great that is trying to keep all of those files in sync and trying to be able to keep things back and forth. So when you're at work, somebody opens up a pull request on GitHub and they're like, hey, I saw somebody just made this commit. I would love somebody to be able to, there's a small little change. Could you go ahead and change this array to being something different? And what happens is you're at work, but my machine's at home. So how do I go ahead and how do I contribute over my lunch hour or in the afternoon? So what we do is we use a command called git config. And what Git config, Git, Git config actually runs at three different levels. So there is um, your system level, so your machine itself. There is a global level, which is sort of like your global identity. And then you have what we call your local identity. So what you may do is, let's say your company internally is using Git and GitHub. Um, what you would do is most likely have your global identity would be your company. That would be um, where you work day to day. And that makes it really easy for being able to do your commits. But let's say you want to go ahead and you want to do a clone out of a repo. You want to pull it down to your machine. And you want to work on it and make some small changes, but you want to use your personal identity. That's when you would use a local. So here, if I do a git config and I do a dash dash list, what it'll end up doing is it'll actually show me um, all of my config options. So let me see here. Let me do a git config list. And here what we can see is we see my basic identity and some of my settings for my machine. So if, you, if it's your first time going through, if you're using any of the GUI tools, most of the time they'll actually walk you through this. They'll check to see if you have a default git config file. If you don't have one, it'll create one for you and then ask you for what do you, is your username, what is your email address, and what it'll do is it'll set all this up for you. Now, if you want to go in and you've got another project, that's when you would go ahead. If I set a git config, if I tried to do a local right now, I'm not in a repository, so it would basically not allow me to be able to do it. I could do a system setting, which would basically just be for this machine. Um, and that would allow me to be able to make some edits and stuff for that period of time uh, underneath the system user. Now, when we actually talk about where code lives, so one of the things that we can do is we talked about a commit. This is going to be probably those of you that have done CVS and SVN. When we talk about doing a commit, this is going to be something that's going to be very confusing to you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a step back and show you what actually happens on GitHub and how GitHub actually thinks about what, where the code actually lives. So here we talk about having a command called git clone. What, if I've got two different databases, what happens is, is a clone basically takes everything that's in this database, picks it up and copies it and puts it in my local database. Now, once I have that local database, what I can do is I can make small little changes in increments. And then what I do is I can take what's in my local database and I can copy and push them back up. So that's kind of the root at how people actually work with GitHub. So what I'm going to do is I actually have a version of GitHub running. This is actually running on a VM on my machine. So we have two different versions of GitHub. We have github.com, 
which is our software as a service version. You, um, basically, the way we make money on that is we have two different types of repositories. We have public repositories and private repositories. If you're just playing around, you can create as many public repositories as you want, free of charge. Not going to cost you anything. It's a great place if you want to learn to be able to go out there. A lot of the online coding uh, places, so like uh, um, uh, Udemy, um, uh, Treehouse, a lot of those all talk about that's where you start, is you actually start from GitHub. That's where all the code lives. And then you put it into a public repo for people to be able to collaborate with you in your class. So um, the other version, the, so the private repos, what we'll do is, depending on the size of your organization, you might have a small startup. So you might pay $25 a month to be able to have 10 private repositories. And those repositories are only seen by people that you invite to be able to see those repositories. The other version of GitHub that we have is our enterprise version. And what the enterprise version does is it's a version that runs in a virtual appliance that you basically put behind your firewall. It's the exact same code, everything exactly the same way that github.com is running, except it runs in a small little virtual appliance that you put in your own infrastructure. So this version right here is actually running GitHub Enterprise. As you can see, it looks exactly the same as github.com for those of you that have been out there before. And right now, if I go and I look on the right-hand side here, I actually have what's called a clone URL. So what this clone URL is actually telling me is this is the location if I wanted to take this database that's sitting on the server and I wanted to put it onto my local machine, I would have to use that URL. So here, this gives me a nice little copy to clipboard. And so now, if I go back over to my command, let me go into, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do that command git clone. And this now is the full URL. Now, the way that this URL is actually defined is this is the machine name. So if you are on github.com, that would just be https colon slash slash github.com slash the next uh, entry is either an organization name or a username. So if this was my user on github.com, it would be leafhouse. This is an organization that I created to be able to share code inside uh, on an enterprise edition. So that organization that we call, I call it Republic. This is what I call my Star Wars demo. So right now I'm acting as Luke Skywalker. Chewbacca is our site admin. Darth Vader is our QA release engineer. So um, we have all kinds of fun with it when I'm doing classes and um, giving demos to customers. Um, so now when I go ahead and do a clone, what I did is I basically took that database from that server and now what I did is I put it onto my local machine. So now if I look in this directory, I do an LS, I'll see that there is a calculator folder so that calculator folder, if I CD into it, and I do an LS, here what I can see is I see three, I, I actually see a folder and two files. Now, the nice thing is, is for those people, again, when we're talking about the VI, Emacs world, there's all kinds of really cool things that you can do with your shell, both PowerShell and from Bash and anything else that you're using. As you can see right here is, I was not in a Git-enabled repository. So because I wasn't in one, my location on my machine didn't show anything unique. As soon as I went into a Git-enabled folder, all of a sudden I am seeing something called master. That is the branch that I am on. So those of you that use SVN, how many of you use branches? How many of you love branches in SVN? Ooh, we've got somebody who loves branches. We need to talk. <laughs> um, so there's a big difference between branches in SVN and branches in Git. A branch in Git, if I'm going to go, I'm going to go a little bit deeper here. So if I get any glassy eyes, I'll, I'll back out pretty quick. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do an ls-la. So now I'm get, seeing all of the hidden files. If we look in here, there is a file that starts with dot git. Yes. Let's see. Let's see where the magic, I know there's a magic button somewhere.
Is that better? In the back? So when I look, I see a dot .git. That's actually a folder. So if I cd into my dot .git folder, here I see this is, remember we were talking about copying that database? That database of going from the server now onto the local machine. This is where all of my changes are actually going to be tracked. So that little virtual file system that sits on top of this, when I create a branch, that branch gets created in this folder and it starts tracking itself, all of the little minor changes. What happens in SVN is if I want to go ahead and create a branch in SVN, I have to do a full copy of that entire file or that entire directory structure and put it into another directory. So for anybody here that does Java coding and you're trying to do branches with subversion, it's a real pain because you have to, if you're working on two different branches, you have to import each one of those independently into your IDE. So if I'm in um, IntelliJ or if I'm in Eclipse, what happens is, is I end up having to import that project and then, heaven forbid, should I be using Maven and now I've got to go ahead and blow away my target folder and I've got to do a rebuild and I've got to clean the cache of my IDE because something's stored in memory that shouldn't be and you end up debugging more about your IDE than you ever get to actually writing code. So because of the way that the file system works inside of um, Git is basically when you switch branches, it's just tracking a different set of files. So I, when I go ahead and I do a clone of a repository and I pull it into my IDE, into Eclipse or into um, IntelliJ, what ends up happening is, is I can switch branches and I just see a change in files. That's all I'm going to see. So let me go back up. So here we can see that we have the same folder structure inside of GitHub. Now, one of the things that a lot of people, they'll compare us with some of our competitors that exist out there. One of the things that I like to tell people is those people that are using an iPhone or using any sort of Android device, a lot of those devices just work. There's things that you just expect. And then when you find little, um, little tidbits about them, you're kind of like, oh, that was actually really cool. So for those people that have used GitHub, I'm going to show you a little trick that maybe you didn't know. So when you're actually on the UI, I can actually hold down the T key. And the T key actually takes me to a filtered search. This is now taking me to the root folder up at the top. And I can actually start typing. So I can actually say calc. And it'll actually start filtering down that list to only those files that have calc in the name. So for those of you that have very large repositories with a lot of files, and you're trying to find that unit test that correlates to an implementation class, what happens is you can actually go straight to GitHub and be able to search for that directly from the web UI. The other thing that you get from this as well is if you're working on an open source project, you might be the team lead. And as the team lead, you don't always want to have to check out the entire repository of you know, a million lines of code, put that on your machine to basically make a one-line comment inside of the code. So one of the things that we can do is from GitHub, this is actually a full-fledged text editor. So what I can do is I can actually click on the edit this file, and I can actually start editing directly from inside of here, and actually commit my changes directly from inside of GitHub. So if you're making a small change, feel free to go ahead and make those changes inside of the web UI. Now, one of the things that we're going to talk about is right now, what we saw both from um, what we saw from here, I am on master. And then also from inside of the web UI, I am actually on master here as well. So here we see the branch. The best practice inside of um, GitHub and Git itself is to do what we call um, branch releases. So if, um, how many people here, I have a talk tomorrow, I'm gonna be talking about continuous delivery and uh, chat ops. How many people here do continuous delivery? Okay, awesome. How often do you deliver? Weekly releases, awesome. Um, I saw another hand over here. How often do you guys release? Uh, every two weeks. Every two weeks? OK. So at GitHub, our releases are not even scheduled. We don't even have weekly releases. 
our releases happen whenever a branch gets merged into master. So we do somewhere in between 30 and 50 pushes into production a day. So one of the things that we do is we go back in and we know that we're doing continuous delivery because we're not asking for approval to go live. We basically have a stand-up meeting the day after to see if anybody's had any problems with the deliveries that happened the previous day. So <clears throat> when we talk about where Git and GitHub is going is when you think about what a branch means is you don't want to think about a branch every branch as a release. You think about a branch as a small bucket of changes that will eventually, or maybe not, depending on the changes that you're making, go back into the master branch. So master for us is what we call the default branch. Now, inside of GitHub, you may want to call that something different. You may not want to call that the master branch. You may want to call that production. And that could be your production branch. And then everybody basically builds their branches off of production and then they merge back into that. So these little buckets of changes in these branches, you can either create them from our web UI or you can actually do that from the command line itself. So. so the first thing you're gonna do, <clears throat> um, the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to go in and you're going to do a git branch. And I'm going to call this, there's different ways. You can use whatever naming conventions you want. So I actually like using what we call feature branches. So I'm going to call something feature add subtraction. And then once I create that branch, I have to check out to that branch. So now I'm going to do a git checkout feature add subtraction. So now you'll see the green down at the bottom. That's now telling me that I'm now on this branch. So any changes that I now make inside of this branch are going to live in this little sandbox. Now, the great thing about this is if we think about being innovative and we think about wanting to play, I go out and I talk to a lot of folks and I talk about one of the things that I really miss in computer science is we have lost the science of computer science. So we don't do a lot of experimentation. We think it's, oh, it should be step one, step two, step three, and we think everything that we commit is production ready. I, I've been developing software for 20 years and there's a lot of things that I write that is nowhere near production ready the first time I write it. So this gives me the opportunity to be able to iterate on my code locally in a nice little area, but I'm only working off of the changes off of the master branch. So everything that's gonna be tracked is off of that master branch. If I get a day into it, and I'm sitting there going, this is not where I wanted to go at all. I can go in and just delete that branch. And then I'm back on master. So I can go back to my good known working state very easily by just deleting the branch. The other thing that I can do is I can also stash those changes. So I could sit there and say, you know what? Somebody just came to me and says, I need to go do a bug fix. So I can take all of my changes that I'm currently working on, stash them, put them off to the side, and then go off and go fix that bug that needs to get done by the end of the day, go make those changes, and then come back in, unstash my changes, bring them back in, and then go back to working again. When you think about that kind of workflow in a subversion or in a clear case or in a CVS type environment, that is really painful. Usually what you end up having is you end up having a whole directory of your project that basically has four or five different versions of the product running on your machine at any point in time. And then it gets really confusing if you're making database changes and which DDL is currently running on the database at any point in time. So you end up doing a whole bunch of DDL scripts to tear it down and build it back up and tear it down and build it back up. So now that we have this particular feature, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to open up my favorite editor which is Atom, so it's an open source editor. Those of you that might be using um, uh, Sublime or uh, any of the other free editors out there, I would love for you to give Atom a chance. Atom is actually our open source editor that we built from GitHub. We open sourced it. It's all written on top of something called Electron. So uh, web developers, any web developers in here? Okay, 
So quickest way to be able to build applications is using Atom because it's actually sitting on top of Chrome. So you basically get the developer tools at the bottom. So you could be building a web application and actually run it directly from inside of your IDE. So here we had a change that we said we wanted to add, do an add subtraction method. So I'm going to save my file. And now I'm back inside my command line. So one of the things, as we're making a change, so so here we did our get branch. So um, if, as you go through these different steps, your branches are creating that sandbox. I created my branch, and then I checked it out. Now, there is a nice little macro shortcut. If you don't want to do those steps, those two steps every time, what you can do is you can do a git branch dash D and then give the name, and it'll actually create the branch and check you out into it all in one step. So that way you don't have to do those two steps every time. So now that we've made our changes, we're in what we call our staging area. So we're now in a location where our little sandbox that we're playing in, these changes, nobody could see these changes right now. But I might want to start keeping track of them. I might want to, I just made my do subtraction method, and I want to go ahead and I want to go ahead and um, uh, I want to commit that. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to do a git status. And what the status is going to do is it's actually going to show me, it's very helpful by telling me what, what I've done. It actually shows me here that I've modified one file. And so my calculator.java file is the file that's actually been changed. So I can actually do a um, git commit. I'm going to do a dash m to specify the message. If you use your git config, you can go in and specify your editor. So you could specify Sublime or um, some other text editor. This is just going to, if I didn't put anything in, it would default to your default editor. So on Mac, it would send me to VI to be able to add a commit message. I'm going to say added subtraction. Oh, I need to specify. Okay, so the first time when I didn't specify the file name, now there are ways to be able to use wildcards and just say commit everything. When you're in a GUI tool, it gives you little check boxes that you can check which files you want to commit. So you don't have to always commit everything. You may actually make four or five changes uh, to six files, and what you want to do is you only want to commit three of them at this particular point in time because you know you're going to continue editing the other three files. So you can do little point, little checkpoints. So now if I do a git status again, here it's telling me there's nothing to commit. My working directory is clean. My sandbox, there's no changes that it's tracking. So if I was in an SVN world right now, I just did a commit. So if I go over to here, let me go ahead and refresh. And mm, my branch isn't here, but I did a commit. Well, let's go look at the files. So let's go back in T and let's look at the calculator. There's no subtraction here either. So this is the really important thing to realize is that with Git, I've made my changes and I've committed them, but it's still on my machine. So the only way that those changes go up to the server is I have to deliberately choose to do a push. So when I'm thinking about, um, I travel all around the world giving presentations, talking to customers. There's a lot of times I'm sitting on an airplane and I go ahead and I want to work. I can go ahead and do a commit and I can work on my project, but I don't have internet access so I can't share with anybody. But I'm keeping all of my changes. I'm tracking everything locally. Then when I land and I go ahead and I do a push, the entire historical record is going to be pushed with it. So here, if I go ahead and now do a git push, 
And what I have to do is I have to tell it where I want it to push to. So I believe that is where it's going to go. Um, uh, let's see here. Now if we go back into the web UI, and let me go back here. Now if I click on the drop down, now my change is ready. So now I see my branch. So even here if I look on master and I look at calculator, there's still no add subtraction on master. But if I go back here and I choose my feature add subtraction, now, if I go in to calculator, now I can see my change. So this change is sitting right there. So now, if I want to take these changes and I want to get them, somebody goes along. This is something that we talk about at GitHub. is called creating a pull request. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to calculator, and I'm going to compare and pull request. This pull request is now something, this is something we want people doing early and often. So I can sit there and I can say, at Republic Developers, I made a change that closes pound. Oh, there's my implement subtraction issue. Um, can I get some eyes on that? So now I create a pull request. This would actually start a conversation. So now other people could actually come in and look and see the added subtraction. They could actually see the changes here and see what's been made. Somebody can come in, make a line item comment, say, hey, I think we should, um, like I could come in here and say, um, probably need some docs here for a public method. So you can actually make line item comments inside of the code, and you can now collaborate with other people. Once you've gotten to a certain point and a whole bunch of people have collaborated, we do this inside of GitHub all the time. Our developers use it. Our um, salespeople use it. Our marketing team uses it. Our legal teams use it. They use it. We use something called Markdown. We just create documents and share, and we can edit them, share them, and collaborate on them. Um, once you get to a certain point that everybody feels like the code is actually ready to be merged, what happens is down at the bottom, we have, um, let me see here. Go to the pull request. What you have here is you can actually merge the pull request. Now, when we were talking before about um, continuous delivery, so now I've now taken those, just those three lines of code that I created. I took those lines of code and merged them into the master file, into the master's file. So one of the things that you can do from here is, let's say I've just done a deployment to production, something goes horribly wrong. Things that you can do is you can actually revert this branch. Um, you'd have to be, uh, right now, Luke only has read-write. But if I was an admin, I could revert this pull request and actually undo the changes and re-inflate that branch to go ahead and make a fix for it. So you don't have to worry about trying to do a whole bunch of fancy stuff behind the scenes. So this is sort of the basics of what Git and GitHub does. And if we go back and look at some of the more advanced things that you can do, um, you can also review the entire history from the command line. So you can go ahead and do a git log. You can basically look on a specific commit and actually see all the files that have been changed. You can actually show the changes for a specific commit. Um, you can, if you've got, uh, we did a push. If somebody else has made changes to that code and they've pushed their changes up, you would do a git pull 
to grab their changes and pull that back down into your sandbox. And then the last thing that you can do is if you get to a certain point and you're like, wait, this is just wrong. Um, the last set of changes, my working changes, I want to just blow those away, but I don't want to lose my commits. I basically want to go back to the last good commit that I had. What you can do is you can do a git reset to the last known good commit, and it'll basically remove all of the tracking changes and put all the files back to their last known good configuration. If you want to go ahead and you actually want to force every all of changes, you can go way back in time and actually do a hard reset, and that will basically blow away all of the history. And then the last thing that I usually get from a lot of people when I'm giving these conversations is, how do I get involved? If I want to do open source and I want to learn more, there's a lot of communities that are out there right now that are looking for people to be able to just to provide documentation, do some basic testing, write some code for them. Um, there's actually something that DigitalOcean is actually putting on right now. It's actually called Hack Hacktoberfest. And what they do is you go out there, you sign up on Hacktoberfest, and um, they've got any open source project that you do off of github.com. Um, if you do four pull requests, uh, you guys have until the end of the month. If you do four pull requests before now and the end of the month, they'll send you a free t-shirt that has the Hacktoberfest, the logo right there on the t-shirt. So anybody who's interested in getting involved, I highly recommend going out there and seeing what the community is doing. And if you've got any questions, I'll be around afterwards to answer them. So thank you very much.